Hello and herzlich willkommen zu unserer Hello and a very warm welcome to our annual press conference 2021 here in Ingolstadt at Audi. As you saw from the invitation, this year's version of the press conference is completely digital. The ongoing pandemic unfortunately made this necessary. And let me point out at this point that the entire team on stage and behind the scenes have been tested, of course, sometimes repeatedly, so that we can dispense with the face masks that are otherwise obligatory, at least here on stage. Last year's press conference was cancelled at short notice. We were hit by the first wave of the pandemic, and we are all the more pleased today to see you online. So welcome, everybody. And let me also welcome the entire team of the Board of Management from Audi, who will also be available for questions later on. Of course, I have to make some housekeeping remarks to introduce the conference. The presentations will be in German, but of course, there is simultaneous interpreting into Chinese and English. After the introduction, you will hear our CEO, Markus Dusmann, and Dr. Arne Antlitz, our CFO, presenting on Fiscal 2020. And of course, there will be the opportunity to send in questions through our online tool. Feel free to do so right now or later on during the Q&A. The year 2020 was a, an outstanding, outstandingly difficult and challenging year. It was a special year for society, for business, for people, for everybody working at Audi as well. I'm sure you've heard this before. But what you're going to hear in a minute is how we dealt with the crisis and managed it. And Markus Dusmann and Arno Antlitz are specifically going to dwell on that. One of the things last year was e-mobility, where there was a major leap forward. And we plan to do the same for this year, 2021. And you can see an impressive example of that next to me, the new Audi e-tron GT which was only presented and launched a few weeks back, and the response has been very, very good. And the second part of our e-mobility campaign will come in April with the global premiere of the Q4 e-tron. Quite soon. Stay tuned. So much for my introduction. But let's briefly look back at the year 2020 now. 2020. You? We're not what we expected. We can't love you, can't celebrate you, but we will always remember you. You were a year that was about more than cars sold, scandals and victories. Health, standing together and persevering. This crazy time really gave change, the digital transformation, a thorough boost. We had a few days to pull off the digital world premiere of our A3. People were able to experience the first digital driving event all over the world. 2020. You also had many great moments. Sporty. Sportback meets e Electric. Distinguished, historical, renewed, and emotional. A lot of fresh faces, reorganization. Audi is setting standards again. In the group, too. Artemis Car Software Org, Vorsprung durch Technik. We assume responsibility. We look to the future. We keep moving forward. But there were also painful experiences. Goodbyes. 2020. You are also about joy and sorrow. About tough struggles. A fresh start. And a new brand orientation. Future 
is an attitude. Our actions are sustainable. Carbon neutral plants in Gyar and Brussels. Continuous improvement throughout the entire supply chain. Socially responsible, even in times of crisis. Electric, digital, open-minded, and courageous. Two thousand twenty. It's time to leave you behind now. You have shaped our path, and will always have a place in our hearts. We are looking ahead. We are stronger in Germany and all over the world. Certain in uncertain times. Different. Thank you for everything, and stay healthy. Yeah. Guten Morgen und herzlich willkommen zur Jahrespressekonferenz. Good morning and welcome to the annual press conference in Ingolstadt. On behalf of the entire board, I would like to welcome you. Now, the film gave us a good summary, standing together, pulling together while staying apart. Since last year, it's been all about exactly this. For many people, 2020 was a challenging year, both economically and emotionally, and it was just as challenging for the automotive industry. I have been with Audi for less than a year, and I don't no Audi pre-COVID. I don't know what Audi will be without COVID. My first few months were dedicated to crisis management as well as safeguarding our liquidity and our leeway to act. We have done everything in our power to emerge from this crisis even stronger and to be able to restart production. We prepared tens of thousands of jobs for pandemic conditions and we rebuilt supply chains after the shutdown in spring. We mastered this crisis as the new management board and we have grown as a result and we have also grown together as a team. For these accomplishments, I would like to say thank you to my board team and naturally to the entire Audi team working for us. So that was the first thing I had to share with you after such a crazy year. Well, COVID nevertheless didn't slow us down. Despite the pandemic, Audi picked up the pace in its transformation even further last year. We are forging ahead with a clear focus on e-mobility, strong collaboration within the Volkswagen Group and a culture that promotes Vorsprung. So let's take a quick look at the sales figures and key financials. After demand for cars collapsed worldwide in early 2020, the market stabilized as the year progressed. Initially, they stabilized in China and later also in Europe and the United States. The lessons learned in spring 2020 and the extensive protective measures meant we were able to largely run production at normal levels in the fall and winter. We even ended the year with record sales in the fourth quarter. Well, lots of catch-up effects, but nevertheless very gratifying. In a first, we delivered more than half a million vehicles to customers in a single quarter. Our retail partners in markets worldwide gave it their all and demonstrated great maximum flexibility. Together, as a strong team, we responded quickly to the changes and we digitalized many processes, ranging from e-commerce to interactive customer service formats. The bottom line is around 1.7 billion cars delivered, down 8.3 percent year on year. The e-tron, Audi's entry into the age of electromobility in 2018, is wowing more and more people worldwide. Last year, the model was the global market leader in its segment, and in Norway, the e-tron was even the best-selling car overall. So, all in all, we delivered nearly twice as many all-electric models as we did in 2019. Nevertheless, our key financials remain impacted by the pandemic and significantly below the previous year. Our operating profit reached 2.6 billion euros and operating return on sales was 5.1 percent. My colleague Arno Antlitz will go into greater detail about the key financials in a moment. The pandemic also had a far-reaching effect on our Italian subsidiaries, Lamborghini and Ducati. The Ducati plant in Bologna 
was closed for seven weeks in spring 2020. Thanks to the high demand for motorcycles in the summer, Ducati sold a total of 48,000 motorcycles in 2020, despite the pandemic. The second half of the year was the best ever for Ducati, limiting the shortfall for the overall year to less than 10%. Today, Ducati is in a more stable position than a year ago, and the current order volume is the highest in years. With its relocation from Cologne to Ingolstadt, Ducati Germany has also underscored its affiliation with Audi in geographical terms. Lamborghini sold 7,430 cars in 2020, making it the second best year in the brand's history. A major success factor is naturally the Euros SUV model, of which the team in Santa Garda have sold over 10,000 units to date. Stefan Winkelmann was once one of the Urus' biggest advocates. In December 2020, he returned to Lamborghini as CEO, and I'm really excited about that. Together with his entire team, he will continue to shape the brand's future success. As I mentioned earlier, despite the pandemic, we resolutely forged ahead with Audi's transformation. Let me give you a few examples. First off, the reorganization of technical development. Since the summer of 2020, we have been systematically improving the way we develop, how we develop. On the one hand, we are rethinking the car as a mobile device, meaning the degree of digitalization, the vehicle electrical system is, a, is more important in the classification than the car body. This is reflected in the new organization. On the other hand, the reorganization aims to shorten development cycles and get innovations into series production faster. Speaking of speed, last June we launched Artemis, an ambitious project for a highly efficient electric car that we will unveil in late 2024, but more on that later. Our strong focus on electrification is also reflected in our motorsport strategy. And that is why in 2020 we restructured our involvement with an eye to the future. We closed the successful DTM chapter in style with a triple win of driver, team and manufacturer titles. In the future, the spearhead of our factory motorsport commitment will be cross-country rally driving. Competing in the, rally, in the Dakar rally from 2022, we will discontinue our commitment in Formula E, and instead we will face the extreme conditions of electrified motorsport. The following year, Audi will also return to the 24 hours of Le Mans and compete with a hybrid sports car in the new Le Mans Daytona hybrid category, which is referred to as LMDH. And in other first, we will join hands with Porsche. Now, a truly historic moment for motorsport fans like myself. With a view to the series, such collaboration is a logical step. We collaborate closely wherever it makes sense and creates synergies in the group. As far as the product goes, this means shared platforms and technologies that benefit both brands, in this case Porsche and Audi. This is yet another example of the new culture of cooperation within the Volkswagen Group. At Audi, we intend to stand for exactly that, for openness and mutual appreciation. It is therefore, of course, very, it's also very important that we continue to work on integrity and compliance even after the monitorship has been successfully completed because that's the very foundation of our business. I still have one more highlight to share. Production of the Edron GT, which is standing right next to me, started at our Berlinger Höfe site near Neckarsul. That was at the end of last year. Now, the Etron GT represents our electric future at Audi, and it is the ultimate proof that electromobility really can be fun. It combines sustainability with a thrilling experience. So I believe it's a wonderful car, as you're going to see in a short film right now. Thank you, and I'll be back. At Audi, we believe in the future of electric mobility. We believe in Vorsprung durch Technik. And we know that we are on the right track.
With the Audi e-tron, we ignited the light to start a new era. We tested it to the max and went extreme to show its power to the world. We've come a long way. We hit the road and step by step, Audi is staying consistently true to its strategy. We are shaping the future of premium mobility. And we are unveiling a great range of fully electric vehicles. With the Audi e-tron GT, we embody our brand core. Living progress. And now, the Audi Q4 e-tron is the first premium electric volume SUV. Audi. Future is an attitude. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to this year's annual press conference. I'm very happy as well to be able to welcome you digitally today. I can say one thing at the beginning, and that is Audi has weathered the COVID-19 pandemic really well because our response to the pandemic was quick and decisive. Our focus was on protecting the health and safety of our employees and their families. We took numerous steps to stabilize our processes and make sure we remain operationally effective. Plus, we secured our liquidity and financial stability. Nevertheless, our key financials also reflect the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID restrictions, declining customer demand and supply chain disruptions led to high volume losses in sales in the first half of the year. However, thanks to a second, strong second half of the year, we were able to make up for a large share of these volume losses. Taking the year as a whole, our deliveries were only 8% down year on year at around 1.7 million vehicles worldwide. We benefited from our attractive model range, the well-organized restart and the systematic switch over to digital sales processes. China was the driving force behind the recovery in our global passenger car markets. Our deliveries in China were already above the previous year's level back in April, setting a new record in 2020 despite the pandemic. In Europe and the US, our recovery gained momentum in the second half of the year. The Audi Group's revenue hit 50 billion euros. The e-tron lineup was a key driver of sales. Our all-electric SUV recorded a major surge in demand in 2020, with year-on-year -year growth of around 80%. The 10% fall in revenue was caused by the drop in volume seen in the first half of the year. This meant that revenue in the first six months of 2020 was still down 29%, but in the second half of the year, we saw the previous year's figure exceeded by 10%. In the 2020 fiscal year, our operating profit reached 2.6 billion euros. Considering the implications of the pandemic, this is a very respectable result. The same is true of our operating return on sales, which stood at 5.1%. Well, ladies and gentlemen, how our operating profit played out over the course of the year shows how the markets developed in the financial year 2020. The pandemic first hit us in the first quarter in China. Our operating profit also suffered as a result of negative valuation effects from commodity and currency hedging. Then came the second quarter and the global lockdown. Despite taking counteraction, particularly in terms of costs and in restarting production, the bottom line was a quarterly loss to the sum of 0 0.8 billion euros. In the third quarter, our good work in terms of costs and our restart measures on the sales side both had a positive impact, and cumulatively we were able to hit break even and move up from there. And in the fourth quarter, we were able to demonstrate what Audi is capable of. With a 14.7% return on sales, the fourth quarter was a record quarter 
Three main factors contributed to this are product momentum and catch-up effects in the markets in terms of demand led to high vehicle sales. We maintained our strict cost and investment discipline towards the end of the year as well. In addition, valuation effects from commodity now had a positive effect. Compared to the previous year, the result was clearly below the previous year's level, but at 2.6, it's clearly positive. Compared to the previous year, which factors led to this performance? At 1.9 billion euros, the drop in sales as a result of the pandemic had by far the biggest impact, negative impact on operating profit in 2020. The effects of exchange rates and commodities that I mentioned earlier hit operating profit by a further 0.3 billion euros. In addition, lower material cost savings caused further issues to the amount of 0.5 billion euros. This includes expenses needed to stabilize our supply chains, particularly in the first half of the year. Cost discipline had a clearly positive impact. Our fixed cost was clearly reduced without compromising on key future projects. The Audi transformation plan played a central role here. In 2020, the year of COVID, we met with particular success in optimizing overhead expenses such as services, travel expenses, or marketing. Since its launch in 2018, the program has already brought in 7 billion euros, making an important contribution to our profitability. In addition, we managed to reduce indirect personnel costs. As part of the Audi Zukunft Agreement adopted in 2019, more than 1,300 employees have accepted early retirement offered from the 1st of July 2020. Special effects in connection with the diesel issue led to a negative effect to our profit, operating profit by 0.2 billion euros. In total, we had 2.6 billion euros in operating profit on our books for 2020. We did not compromise at all when it came to our research and development activities. The 17% reduction was largely attributable to three factors. First, pooling the group-wide software development at the CAR software organization. Second, increasing the efficiency in technical development. And third, systematically exploiting synergies. One of Audi's strengths in 2020 was once again cash generation. At 4.6 billion euros, our net cash flow reached a strong level, well above the previous year. This reflects our strict discipline when it comes to investments and our careful vehicle inventory management. For instance, we reduced capital expenditure by around 30% to 1.9 billion euros, primarily in structural investments. Our capex ratio in 2020 was 3.8%, more than one percentage point below the previous year. Furthermore, production was managed more in line with demand and we, we reduced stocks by 9.3% from the end of 2019. Proceeds from the divestment of group companies of around 1.5 billion euros also had a major positive impact. But adjusted for these one-time effects, our net cash flow almost reaches the previous year level as well, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, which is strong evidence of just how robust our company is. In 2021, we want to capitalize on the strong momentum we achieved at the end of last year. We know this remains a challenge. It's still unclear how the pandemic will develop. This includes possible impacts on economic development and the wider passenger car markets across the globe. There is additional risk when it comes to the sufficient supply of semiconductors for the entire automotive industry. We are striving to keep the operating impacts of the current undersupply of semiconductors as low as possible and to compensate for them as far as possible during the remainder of the year. We also intend to increase Audi brand deliveries alongside revenue in 2021. We expect an operating return on sales of between 7 and 9%. 
we will stick to our roadmap of strict cost discipline, cost and investment discipline, and in doing so, we are proceeding with caution at the same time so that we can systematically prioritize investments in our future. We're increasing our upfront expenditures in products and future technologies. Instead of the previous 5 to 6 percent, going forward, we'll be budgeting 6 to 7 percent of revenue for R&D. To finance this increase, we are lowering our target range for capital expenditure by one percentage point to 4.5 percent of sales revenue. This is our way to underscore our standing as an innovation leader, accelerating our transformation into a provider of connected, sustainable premium mobility. For net cash flow, we expect to reach a level of between 3.5 and 4.5 billion euros in 2021. We are expecting a full recovery and the return of the passenger car markets to pre-pandemic levels in 2022. We intend to take advantage of this and are looking to expand our market share thanks to our emotive product portfolio. For 2022, we're aiming for a return on sales within our strategic target range of 9 to 11 percent because it's only sustainable profitability that will create the leeway for necessary investments into the future. At 35 billion euros over the entire planning period until 2025, our upfront investments remain high, despite the challenging economic environment. Half of this amount, around 17 billion euros, is earmarked for future technologies, of which 10 billion euros will be spent on e-mobility, 5 billion on hybridization, and by 2025, we plan to have more than 20 all-electric models on the market, as well as a broader PHEV portfolio. In line with our planning, one in three Audis delivered in 2025 will be an electric or hybrid car. A further 3 billion euros will be spent on digitalization. This is where Audi benefits from the pooling of vehicle-related software expertise at the Car Software Organization. This new Volkswagen Group company is developing a shared electronics platform or architecture and operating system for all group brands. As you have seen, our investment planning leave no room for doubt leaves no room for doubt. We are comp not compromising on product substance and are very much prioritizing key areas for the future. Audi will be electric, digital and sustainable. The key to our success here will be economic scaling of e-mobility. Audi is leveraging group-wide synergies and cross-group platforms to reach this goal. Alongside Porsche, we are using the premium electric platform, premium platform electric, more specifically PPE with a planned volume of seven, up to 7 million vehicles by 2030 in the premium and luxury segments. And for the compact and mid-side segments, we are using MEB, the modular e-drive system. As of 2021, we are already using this platform with a new and highly emotional Q4 e-tron lineup. Looking ahead, I'm glad that we have set out clear priorities for Audi. We are aiming at a consistent operating return on sales of between 9 and 11 percent. We are forging ahead with our e-mobility product initiative as well, of, as well as with digitalization across our products and processes. In doing so, we are leveraging hardware and software synergies within the Volkswagen Group to the benefit of our customers. We are optimizing our cost structure. We are continuing to invest in the Audi brand to improve our positioning. And we continue to develop our corporate culture. Integrity and compliance are the cornerstones of our strategy and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my last annual press conference as CFO of Audi. It has been an honor and privilege to be able to work for such a wonderful brand alongside this great team led by Marcus Duzman, the entire Audi team. As of April, I will play a new role in Audi's journey, its journey toward an emission-free digital and profitable future. I'm absolutely sure of that. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Arno. You just heard it. Despite a challenging fiscal year, Audi is optimistic about the future. We are clearly committed to sustainable premium mobility. Our focus is clearly on battery electric cars, which we are now putting on the road year after year. In 2021, our e-initiative is gaining further momentum. For the first time, more than half of all new models launched will be all electric. This year, we are launching four new models, the e-tron GT, the RS e-tron GT, the Q4 e-tron, and the Q4 Sportback e-tron. This more than doubles the number of all electric models from three to seven. The Q4 e-tron is our entry-level offering into the electric world of Audi, and I cannot wait to showcase it in April. Overall, we are significantly increasing the number of our electrically powered models by 2025. We are planning more than 20 all-electric models, as well as a rapid expansion of the plug-in hybrid portfolio. Plug-in hybrids are a key transitory technology for us, especially in Europe. This is why we are expanding our offerings this year to include more than a dozen plug-in hybrid models. There will be such a model, a plug-in hybrid model in more than 50% of combustion engine model series. In 2021, more than 80% of Audi's model series will have an electrified drive system on offer. We are pleased that matching our offering, expansion of the charging infrastructure is in full swing. Policymakers have recently provided important impetus for this. This is one of the contributions of politics to the transformation to e-mobility. Our customers' contribution is to move away from the combustion engine and make the personal decision to buy an electric car. We see our contribution as companies, as Audi and the Volkswagen Group, as making e-mobility very attractive and naturally profitable. Our efforts are therefore aimed at achieving maximum scalability, including in battery systems and platforms. The first Artemis model will be equipped with new battery technology, the new group-wide uniform cell format. When it comes to the platforms, we are taking things one step at a time. Following our MEB, the Modular Electrification Toolkit or System, we will launch the premium platform Electric PPE next year. The next step will be to bring together all Volkswagen Group brand e-models on a shared, flexible platform. And that will be our task for the coming years. The Green Deal makes Europe the pioneer of e-mobility transformation, battery electric vehicle transformation, and we want to play a leading role in it. Audi's electrification initiative is also underway in China. In the next few years, we will offer further models of the e-tron range in China or localize further models. This is how, by 2025, we will expand our portfolio to seven locally produced all-electric models. Together with our partner FAW, we have founded a new company, the Audi FAW New Energy Vehicle Company. From 2024, we will jointly launch local production of electric cars on the PPE platform. Construction of the new plant in Changchun is scheduled to start this May. Sales and marketing activities in China will in future be handled by a new sales company, FAW Audi Sales Company. The company will be responsible for the sales of e-cars of the new joint venture, and it will consolidate new business areas under one umbrella. With our headquarters in Hangzhou, we have deliberately chosen one of the most dynamic and innovative regions in the country in China. Together with Werner Eichhorn, our head of Audi China, we are driving the realignment of our China business. And with this, I would like to hand over to Werner Eichhorn for a direct insight into our largest worldwide market. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Dusman, and hello from Beijing. The Chinese market is the biggest market globally and has been the most important one for Audi for years. And it's very encouraging that the premium segment has developed very favorably. The year 2020 saw an all-time high when it comes to sales levels. For the very first time, more than 700,000 vehicles were delivered to customers. And this positive trend continues this year. Both for locally produced and imported cars, there's been a clear increase. In the first two months of 2021, Audi delivered more than 135,000 cars in China. Never before have we seen such a boost at the start of a year. Just after the world premiere, the brand new Audi e-tron GT was presented to selective Chinese media and the response was overwhelming. The e-tron GT represents the spirit of the new Audi that we intend to be successful with in China in the coming 10 years. When it comes to our strategic orientation and alignment, we have achieved major milestones, as Mr. Dusman has pointed out. With our PPE project, we are breaking new ground. For the very first time for Audi in China, we will hold the majority in this joint venture. The Audi FAW NEV venture is the, at the center of our future setup at the same time when it comes to China, because by 2030, by 2030, annually about 40% of all premium cars will be NEVs. Together with our two strategic partners, FAW and SAIC, we have established an excellent solution for the distribution and service of all future Audi products from, Ch from Shanghai. Ideally, all Audi products will be supported by one dealer organization, paving the way for the market launches in the first quarter 2022. A new sales company with FAW VW was established in Hangzhou, which is no coincidence. This city is at the center of one of the economically most powerful regions in China and one of the high-tech centers of the country. And our product transformation was also launched successfully. The Audi e-tron is manufactured at FAW VW locally, and the e-tron Sportback is about to be launched, followed by the e-tron GT at the end of the year, both imports. With these milestones, we are consistently pursuing the realigned business model. And with that, back to you, Mr. Dusman. Thank you, Werner Eichhorn and the entire Audi team in China. We continue to see great potential in China, especially in the premium segment. With additional models, we will enter new segments with our partners FAW and Psyc and make the needs of our Chinese customers an even higher priority. So that is China. Let's now return to Germany. Our Ingolstadt site here is in the midst of preparing for the production of all electric models. Remodeling includes, for instance, a conversion of the old A3 body in white into the PPE body in white facility. The first all-electric model to roll off the assembly lines from 2022 is the new Q6 e-tron. The launch of this model will mark the start of an all-electric assembly line in Ingolstadt. And we are also establishing an in-house battery assembly right in the direct vicinity of car assembly. Preparations for this facility are in full swing. We are currently installing, wiring, programming and commissioning about 70 robots. As part of the transformation toward future technologies, we have trained around 28,000 staff worldwide in the e-mobility requirements since 2017. Last year alone, we trained an additional 3,000. We are also gradually preparing our second German plant in Neckarsul for electrification. As the production site for the plug-in and mild hybrids of the A6, A7 and A8 models, the plant already has the highest share of electrified models of any Audi site. And since late 2020, Audi Neckarsum has also been making the first all-electric Audi model at a German site, the e-tron GT. Our Hungarian site in Gyr in, already produces the Audi Q3 and Q3 Sportback plug-in hybrids as well as e-drives for the e-tron. With new products and innovative technologies in e-drive production, we are securing the future of local 
drivetrain drive manufacturing in Kia. In the future, Kia will take over production of the new generation of e-drives for models on the PPE platform, giving us an important competitive edge on the growing market for electrified cars. Overall, the international positioning of the Audi Group is helping us to vigorously implement our e-roadmap Every site is making its important contribution. While electrifying our plants, we are also setting the pace in the development of forward-looking e-models. After almost nine months, we have now reached an important milestone in the Artemis project. We have successfully completed the concept phase for the first Artemis model to be launched in 2024. The vehicle project is now being created in technical development at Audi. The model plays a key role in the relevant model series. Among other things, it is spearheading the further development of our new electronics architecture. Artemis is also designing innovative development methods, processes and tools. The Car Software Organization is developing the new uniform operating system for the first Artemis model in parallel. This new software will then be used in all subsequent group models. As the software development unit, the Car Software Organization and its workforce of about 4,000 people will work together with the brands to set new technological standards for the automotive industry. As a strong technology partner, the unit pools key skills, facilitating enormous economies of scale. This is relevant, for instance, in the context of automated driving, which is set to play an increasingly important role from the middle of this decade. In this area in particular, the Car Software Organization relies on a strategic partnership. Together with Microsoft, the unit is establishing a cloud-based automated driving platform which will use cloud and data services to be able to realize automated driving functions in less time. What I consider vital in this context is that we use new technologies responsibly. This means that we will only roll out fully automated driving functions when they are sufficiently tested and safe, safe to use for our customers. Team play and corporate synergies make us strong, and the Car Software Organization is a good example of this. In the future, another example will be the closer cooperation between Audi and Bentley. Audi assumed management responsibility for the British brand as of 1st of March. Together we will continue to drive the top issue of the future, sustainability. We want to leverage important synergies for the electrification strategies of both brands. Porsche and Bentley have done an outstanding job in the sport and luxury brand group. We can now build on this foundation. Thank you for that to all the teams at Porsche and Bentley. Bentley is a brand with a unique heritage and identity. We see it as our responsibility to support Bentley on its way to becoming the world's most sustainable luxury automotive brand. In doing so, we can draw on our long-term experience in developing prestigious brands such as Lamborghini and Ducati. With the success of Lamborghini, Audi has shown that sustained financial success in the ultra-luxury segment is possible. Over the years, the teams at both Audi and Lamborghini have developed a sense of mutual identification with their respective brands. This sense of community is what we also want to foster with Bentley. A few concluding remarks on the future outlook before we come to your questions. COVID-19, unfortunately, is far from over. Still here in 2021. At the same time, we are repositioning ourselves and are shaping Audi's transformation head on. The pandemic has highlighted even more clearly the responsibility of our industry as a key player. We have great leverage to boost overall economic development in Germany and in Europe. This makes it all the more important to align our business models with the demands of the future today. Only a healthy automotive industry can shape sustainable mobility. This is our responsibility to all those who have worked tirelessly over the past year on the future of Audi. 
This year, there will once again be an Audi profit sharing payout, which amounts to 1,080 euros for skilled workers in the German plants. In addition, Audi is paying a special bonus of 1,200 euros to employers of Audi AG who are paid according to the collective wage agreement to show appreciation of their flexibility and commitment during the corona pandemic. This year is our brand claim Vorsprung durch Technik Turn 50. In recent months, I have often been asked in interviews whether Audi will continue to be known for Vorsprung durch Technik. And my answer is yes. In matters of design, the e-drive and quality, we are already ahead of the competition and we are catching up in connectivity and digitalization. Audi is a strong brand and we all, as a strong team, have the potential to do just that. We will be pioneering the transformation of our industry. We will do our utmost to deliver on our promise for a Vorsprung that exceeds technological innovation and reaches the hearts of our customers with outstanding cars. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Markus and Mr. Antlitz. Now I would like to welcome, in addition to the two speakers you just saw, Markus Dusman and Dr. Arno Antlitz, I would like to welcome the entire team of the Board of Management here on the stage. I would like to welcome Sabine Masen, responsible for HR, Hildegard Bortmann, who is responsible for sales and marketing, Peter Kössler, who is responsible for production and logistics, Dirk Ruselohaide, who is responsible for procurement and IT, and naturally our new board member for technical development, Oliver Hoffmann. Just let me briefly comment on our Q&A session. Please submit your questions to us. Some of you already submitted questions before this conference. Please use the box below the live stream window. In the next 60 minutes, we would like to answer as many questions as possible. So just two short notes. So wherever possible, just submit one question each, in each case and only in English or in German. I hope you understand that possibly because of the limitation to 60 minutes, we cannot answer all of your questions. I hope you understand this. And this is why we are going to start now without any further delays with the first question. Stefan Stahl from Augsburger Allgemeine Zeitung. Sorry, no Augsburger Allgemeine. Mr. Stahl, I should really know the name of this publication. You're asking, Volkswagen is still reducing its workforce, even if it's in a socially acceptable way. So beyond Audi Zukunft, does Audi also have plans for additional staff reductions? Thank you, Mr. Stahl, for the question. Since it's a fundamental question, I would like to ask Markus to answer it. Right, the answer is clearly no. We certainly maintain our promise to secure jobs by or Audi Zukunft is regulating our reductions and changes, up to 9,500 employees will be reduced. Jobs will be reduced by 2025. At the same time, 2,000 additional employees will be hired in the future-oriented field. So that's our plan and it still applies. Next question from Hungary. Mr. Biro is asking, the Audi Q4 e-tron, where will it be built? That's a typical production question, Mr. Kössler. Yes, I'm happy to answer it. Q4 e-tron for the compact car segment, we are using the modular electrification system, MEB, of the Volkswagen Group. And this is why, particularly now in the launch phase of electrification, we are benefiting from these synergies within the Volkswagen Group. In the Q4 e-tron, will be built in Zwickau in Saxony in the Volkswagen plant together with further group models from Volkswagen or Seat. Thank you. So then the next round of questions, Mr. Thomas Schmidtutz from the Münchner Merkur is asking, ladies and gentlemen, because of supply bottlenecks for semiconductors, that's a topic which of course we expected today, production at Audi also had to be reduced. So what do you expect for the next few weeks? Are you expecting further 
bottlenecks in supply or possible disruptions to your production, and if that's the case, at which sites? So that's once again a production question. Now, the bottleneck, of course, affects the entire automotive industry. We are cooperating with our partners continuously to make sure that the impact of the worldwide supply bottleneck, or which affects production, can be minimized. The production schedules of the various plants will, of course, depend on the supply situation. Depending on the current, or in view of the current situation, we assume that in coming months, supply will be quite difficult and demanding, but we will do our utmost to make sure that any cars that we have not built so far, that we will build them in the course of the year, so we can catch up or compensate for uh, which has not been produced. So the highest priority is executing the very high order backlog. This brings us to a question from, if I see this correctly, from Romania, Mr. Sokolov, Autostyle. According to an interview in Automobil Woggy, Markus Dusman said, so CEO of Audi said that as of now, the company will, is going to abandon plans for the development of new spark ignition and diesel engines. I have to correct it. It was an interview with FAZ, which was quoted later on. Does it mean that in the next five to seven years, there will not be a generation of S and RS models with um, a gasoline or spark ignition engine, petrol engine? Markus, can you say more about it? Now, the precise answer is we are not going to develop new engine generations, but we are revising our existing engines to make them more efficient, to increase their power output, and also with a view to the emissions of pollutants. We certainly do that, but we do not plan to produce a new generation of combustion engines. Well, naturally, the very popular S and RS models will also be offered in future with combustion engines. So in the next generation of A4 and A6, we will also see uh, combustion engines and also RS models. Now with this, we go to China. Mr. Jin. Xiao Yu is asking, from Global Times, he is asking, do you believe that the adaptation to the management team and the adaptation of the organization and product development in Audi, that it actually has paid off, that you can see the benefits after one year? That's a general question, Markus. You might want to answer it. Well, I certainly think that it's paid off, that it's shown its merits because we responded early on and uh, our product line management was also restructured at an early stage and we saw some first successes. You might not have seen them yet, but they will certainly come soon. And as far as software is concerned, I think we really caught up and we pooled our resources in the car software organization. So we are indeed very confident all in all. Well, some um, rears still have to be caught up with without giving up our headway, our lead in other areas. So we are really very confident. Thank you. So then let's go back to Germany. Mr. or Dr. Dambach from the Südwestrundfunk is asking, now, what does the future strategy look like for future years for Neckarsul, investments, electric models, headcount? For this, I would hand over to Mr. Kössler, production network. Well, naturally, the German sites are the backbone of Audi. They are the backbone of the production network. In particular, in Neckarsul, with, uh, we started with electrification in Germany, in the Berliner Höfe, where we produce our first German electric model, the Etron GT. We started producing it in late 2020. It was launched, production was ramped up in, right in the middle of the pandemic, and it was really successful. So Audi is really making strong investments in the future of our second core site here in Germany, Neckarsulm. And we have um, set up a fund for electrification of 300 million euros, which is available exclusively for Neckarsulm. And that's our most important site for um, PHEV technology for plug-in hybrid vehicles. And we are already training our employees so they can cope with the requirements of electrification. And that means we are executing um, the transformation already as far as our employees and skills are concerned. Let's stay in Germany. Dietmar Krepper from um, Media Mobilis is asking, what role does the fuel cell play in Audi's e-mobility strategy, in our roadmap in the area of electrification? And this I would like to hand over to to our board member for development. 
Now, Audi has taken the lead in the Volkswagen Group for the development of fuel cell technology. Now, as a matter of principle, we have taken the decision that we want to really master this technology within the group, but at the moment we do not see any major application for passenger cars. And this is because of the availability of green hydrogen in particular. But what we need is a clarity on this technology, and we have a full focus on our battery electric mobility for our vehicles in the next decade. But we are still um, also managing fuel cell technology, and we are monitoring the market. Thank you. With this, we go to the UK. Mr. Piers Ward is asking, now in view of the massive investments that Audi made in electric vehicles, 37 billion by end of 24, when is this going to pay off for the company? When are you going to recoup these investments, Mr. Antlitz? Now at the moment, demand for battery electric vehicles is very high, 20-23% BEV share, and of course the share is now increasing. And now the Q4 e-tron and Sportback version will be launched soon. So with increasing group synergies, electric um, system MEB and PPEs, battery costs will decline. And in the next two or three years, we believe that the return on sales for the vehicles of combustion engines and BEV uh, vehicles will become more similar. So altogether with this ramp up of the more profitable BEV vehicles as of 22, we plan to have 9 to 11 percent, the strategic range once again for return on sales, operating return on sales with an increasing share of BEVs. Thank you. Then next, Susanne Stefan from Focus Magazine. Uh, good morning. We heard a lot about Artemis and Trinity. Could you please briefly describe how Artemis integrates with Trinity, how those two cooperate with each other, and what are the competences at Audi, and which competences does Volkswagen have, Marcus? Well, as I already mentioned in my presentation, Artemis will be the first model with a new software and hardware platform using this new platform, and this will be followed by lots of other models in the group, and Trinity is another one of these models, the first Volkswagen model on the new software platform, and then there will be further models. So it's not a question of um, integration. The, they will be launched one after the other. Now the competence is within is pulled within the car software organization, and of course all of the group brands will have access to it. Okay, with that, let's go back to China again. Ms. Wu Ziyi from China Business News is asking, many technology companies want to cooperate with traditional OEMs to build cars, Geely, Baidu, Apple. What's the impact of this on the automotive industry, or what will it be? Another question of principle, Marcus, so over to you again. Okay. Of course, new players. Well, let me start again. We're very happy that mobility is something that so many are interested in. Even companies that weren't working in mobility are entering it now. And of course, they accelerate the transformation, so we welcome that very much. When it comes to CSO, software and development, of software and hardware, we are stepping on it full speed and we're observing what the new players are doing and wherever it makes sense, we'll cooperate. When it doesn't, we will seek standalone solutions for the group and this will be decided over time. Thank you. Let's move to Belgium. Jan Nagels from Belgian News Agency is asking, in an interview with Business Insider last month, Mr. Dusman promised a successor to the e-tron to be built in Brussels. Can you confirm that and elaborate? A question about production. Okay, me again, good. The current e-tron is extremely popular and is only at the start of its life cycle. It has a third of it behind only. So we don't really have to think about what to do in Brussels afterwards now. Brussels is part and parcel of our produ production footprint, so there will be a way of utilizing the Brussels capacity when the time has come, and we'll announce it when the time has come, but it's too early. Thank you. 
Let's stay with production. Christian Gleicher from Heilbronner Stimme. He's asking how high the investment in digitalization of production and logistics will be specifically for Neckarsulm in the next few years. Mr. Kessler? Digitalization is relevant for production as well, and not only that, but extremely important. When it comes to Neckarsulm, it will spearhead digitalization of production. By 2025, we want to be the leading factory when it comes to digital production and develop all the steps there. We're using the IT cluster in the region, in Heilbronn specifically, the TUM, University of Munich, and the Fraunhofer Institute, or XL2. In that sense, we're also training everybody working at Audi and use specific digitalization projects in production for that purpose. We build our own software development center for IT solutions for that purpose, working together with Dirk Rosse Loheide's team with IT specialists for production and logistics specifically. Before we move on, I need to switch to English because we have uh, a technical glitch with the um, English translation. Uh, so uh, we are working on that. Hopefully we are back with the English ver version in uh, just a few seconds. Damit gehen wir nach Stuttgart. Okay then, let's move on to the next question. Stuttgart, Thomas magenheim Mürheim from Stuttgarter Zeitung is asking, what about the headcount in Germany between 20 and 21? How will it change? Ms. Maaßen. As you have just said, Audi Punkt Zukunft as a plan includes a clear agreement on a headcount reduction of up to 9,500 by the year 2025, but at the same time recruitment of up to 2,000 FTEs in our focus areas of the future as well. That's also on the plan. So 2021 will be a year of transformation, including training as well, and we're investing good money in that. There will be an annual training budget of about 80 million euros specifically for that. Thank you. Moving on to Mexico. Mr. Eric Axel Sanchez from El Fianciero is asking, are there any plans for the electric Audi Q5 to be produced in Mexico? Will you be interested in producing another model in Mexico? And do you trust in the Mexican government? I'd like to ask Mr. Kessler to answer that. Well, for Mexico, I can say the same thing that I said for Brussels. Mexico is also part and parcel of our production network. At the moment, the Q5 Sportsback is being launched in that plant, and the main model Q5 is there as well. It's a PHEV, the new one, which means that Mexico has been electrified in that sense. We also see the successor to that in Mexico. So when it comes to utilizing the plant, there are no worries. All right, let's go back to Germany. Thomas Magenheim Hörner from Stuttgarter Zeitung. The CO2 fleet emissions level for 2020 in the new car fleet, how did it develop? Marcus, please. Oh, I'm sorry. The, when, when it comes to the fleet goals for 2020, we clearly outperformed them. The mixed uh, PHEVs that we have in the portfolio make a contribution towards the corporate group as well. And for 2021, we also expect to undercut the CO2 value at Audi or for Audi. A question from Hungary again. Mr. Andras Schurenji, apologies for my pronunciation. The future of the five-cylinder engine, for long, how long will it be secure? I think it's a question for our development board member. The five-cylinder engine is a very emotional engine because of the power 
and its great characteristics, including the sound and also very consistent lightweight design. The five-cylinder engine is an absolute USP in the competitive environment as well. And the current models for the RS3 and the RSQ3 uh, are very successful. The new RS3 will come this year with the next generation, the new generation five-cylinder engine, which is a very clear statement vis-a-vis -vis the many, many fans worldwide. Thank you. Norway is next. The market in which our e-tron is number one. What's the biggest challenge when it comes to converting to e-vehicles? And I guess that would be a question for Hildegard. Yes, I can gladly answer that. There are many challenges, but let me add that we're very well prepared. Fifteen billion invested by 2025 in electrification, more than 20 fully electric models by the year 2025. So e-mobility is something that's a clear priority for Audi and is really picking up speed. E-mobility, but also everyday use and emotion is what our e-cars will stand for, which is our core business. And I think we'll be successful there. When you look at the e-tron GT, when you look at the coming Q4 e-tron, they are very good examples of that. But of course, an all-out charge infrastructure is also needed and renewable energies are part of the equation increasing BEV volumes and lowering material costs will also mean that we'll be able to approach the cost of the two, electric and ICE, so we're very well prepared. Thank you very much. Let's turn to a question that's been asked before in a similar way, but let's come back to it. Carsten Lemmens from Der Standard in Belgium. What are the repercussions of the scarcity of computer chips for Audi? How long will that take? And what does it tell us about how fragile the supply chains of semiconductors in the automotive industry are? And how can it be solved? A question for, for and about procurement. As a matter of fact, there is a massive global bottleneck when it comes to the supply of semiconductors. That's a general problem in the automotive industry. What caused it is mainly the clear increase in demand from consumer electronics and other similar industries. As Peter Kessler has said, we adapt our production in a very flexi flexible way. My assumption is that supplies will remain volatile this year as well. We responded straight away last year with a task force on group level where we were and are looking at this in the day-to-day -day way of working, making sure that we ensure supply. And I think I can safely say that this has been quite successful. But I also think that this will something will is something that will continue this year. But I guess that uh, by the third quarter, we should be on firmer ground again. Thank you. Mr. Johansson from Automobilwoche. First of all, he's commenting that there was a short glitch in the stream before. So he'd like to hear the explanation on Ingolstadt and the production of e-vehicles. Mr. Kessler. Of course. Quite shortly, the first PPE models will be produced in Ingolstadt. That will be in 2022. An attractive model will be produced in Ingolstadt based on the PPE family. And of course, in Ingolstadt, there will also be battery assembly, which is something that we are building as we speak to make sure that the batteries are available for production then. So Ingolstadt will be very BEV electric. Thank you. Let's move on to Switzerland. Mr. Delap from Automobile Review is asking, we don't hear a lot about the sales results of electric cars. Maybe I should communicate even more. The e-tron SUV, is it a success or not in business or financial terms? A question for Hildegard Mortmann. Hello, a gritzy from me. And yes, clearly it's a success. The Audi e-tron, including the sport back 
has a lot of performance, 80% higher year on year, 50,000 units sold last year. The Audi e-tron is the number one in Norway, but also in many other European countries where it's in a leading position, including Switzerland, where it's very strong, as I'm sure you've heard. That is why it's very important for us that the e-tron is making an important contribution when it comes to covering our investment in e-mobility. And I think this proves that this was a good start as one of the first, the only OEM that has three electric cars on the road and with the Q4 another one will follow. So yes, this is a success. Thank you. Let's go back to China. Mr. Liu Wei is asking, he's from the Internet Info Agency, irrespective of Volkswagen or Audi, whoever you listen to, the essential issue is transformation towards e-mobility. What are the specific plans of Audi for China? Let me hand that to Marcus. In my speech, I said we have a major initiative in China. Audi and FAW are producing the electric Q2 e-tron and the A6 LTFSI e version. They used to be imported. The imported e-tron will be produced in Changchung in the future, that is, and six new models. NEF models, battery electric models will be launched in the Chinese market. And that's the first wave of the big E initiative for China. Question from Hungary, Mr. Andras. Well, I think I did not pronounce it correctly before. Serenyi, I guess, sorry if I mispronounce it. Question on the sports cars. Now, is Audi participating in the development of a successor to the THD Router and Coupe? Are you interested in developing such a successor, or is the current series going to be maintained until the end of production? I'm looking at the board member responsible for development here. The Audi TT is really a very special model for the Audi brand, and we are very happy about the fact that it's so popular with customers. The Audi TT has a very high share in its segment. However, in a shrinking segment, at the moment we are closely analyzing what this means for a TT successor, but we are working to create a really emotional sports car successor concept, and I would be happy at one of the next of these conferences to tell you a bit more about it. Thank you. Then we have a question from Max Hegler from Süddeutsche Zeitung. Good morning, Mr. Hegler. Well, from 2023, no new combustion engines were to be developed, you said. So what about e-fuels? What's your attitude concerning e-fuels? I'd like to ask Marcus to answer this question. Of course, we have gained valuable insights with the synthetic production of fuels ourselves. And in Valte, we have a power-to-gas facility, which we have been using for many years. Now, from, for economic and strategic reasons, we do not plan to produce our own fuel. We can only well, show what technologies we would prefer, but um, well, the battery electric vehicles, now that's a fleet technology. Synthetic fuels also make it possible to make our existing fleet CO2 neutral, but we are basically focusing on BEVs. With this, we go to Hungary, Mr. Tamas Kolosa. Now, in Kyr, in Hungary, do you plan to produce all electric models? Mr. Kessler, that's for you. Now, first of all, Yonapod Kivanov to Hungary. I'm always happy to receive a question from Hungary. Now, as I said before, with a Q3, the plant is the plant's capacity is extremely well used. The Q3 is produced as a Q3 and a Q3 Sportback also as a PHEV vehicle, and that means we already produce electric vehicles in Hungary. And at the moment, within the group, we are thinking about what should come after this for Hungary. And of course, with the further growth of e-mobility and the further increase in the number of models, well, Audi Hungaria would be a preferred site. 
Thank you. With this, we would like to move to Daniel Zwick from Welt and Welt am Sonntag. He's asking subscription models. What role are they going to play in Audi sales in future? Are there any um, targets for the share of subscriptions in the overall sales volume? Hildegard, thank you for the question. With Audi on demand, we already have an umbrella brand for uh, the mobility services, and with this we already offer our customers the flexible a flexible option for driving an Audi. But we would like to live up to the premium aspiration of our brand as well. And I think with this mobility platform, Audi On Demand, we can do this quite well already. In the course of the year, probably in the second quarter, we will have a fully integrated subscription solution for a term of one to 12 months. So that's another thing that we will set up, and this will close the gap between leasing contracts, which started 12 months, and short-term rental, which in Audi, with Audi on demand, covers up to 28 days. So I think uh, soon I can tell you a bit more about it, but the mobility services platform under the umbrella brand of Audi on demand is on the right track. Thank you. Mr. Jack Ewing from New York Times. Jack, good morning. Very early for you. A question which goes directly to Mr. Dusman. Could you please explain your battery strategy? Will premium customers get a different technology from the volume models of the Volkswagen Group? And if that's the case, could you be more specific, please? Well, we are pooling all our activities relating to batteries in the group, or we have pooled them, and you probably heard that before. Then you uniform cell we are going to use will be in, used in the Artemis in 2024 for the first time and also in, rolled out in other vehicles so that approximately 80% of the portfolio will get this cell, be it premium or volume segment, across the board 80% of the volume will be covered with this cell. This will also allow a significant de decrease in battery cost and of course we would also benefit from this for premium models. Thank you. Then question from Gabriel Wirt from the Bayerische Rundfunk. Good morning, Mr. Wirt. He's asking, what do you say about the strikes of the Metalworkers Union in Ingolstadt or their collective bargaining demands? How would you comment on them? Now, we as a company, we do not interfere with ongoing negotiations. It's a good tradition that the association should negotiate with each other. And uh, we don't want to interfere with this, and we would just wait and see how these negotiations progress. Thank you. Mr. Pretzler from the Stuttgarter Zeitung, good morning. How important are the new mobility services such as car sharing? How important are they for Audi? Hedegaard. That's a question for you once again. Well, it's clear that we intensively monitor this topic, but honestly, we cannot directly jump on every bandwagon. We have to have business models which are naturally attractive to our customers, but which are, are also economic and scalable for us. And then, of course, it helps us a lot to be able to leverage synergies with the Volkswagen Group, with the other um, group brands, so that we can develop a mobility platform together. And we as Audi would very deliberately rely on premium mobility also in the future. So sharing for the short term is certainly not the right option. Our customers consciously opt for the Audi brand and not simply for a means of transportation to get them from A to B. And as we said before, Audi on demand is our mobility platform for us. And there we offer our mobility services in the premium segment. And as announced, the subscription model will come and we'll tell you more about it very soon. Thank you. Then a question from Mr. Herrn, from Mr. Hetzner, Automotive News Europe. Good morning, Mr. Hetzner. Now the decision for increased vertical integration, what does it mean? Is it only temporary until the complete BEF value chain has been established and then it's going to be um, undone, it's going to be reduced once again the vertical integration? This relates to production, Mr. Kössler. Now, as I said before, 
the development towards electric mobility will naturally also have an influence on our value of production streams are the content of our production. We are developing the strategic targets for our plants at the moment, and naturally, electric mobility, uh, of course, will be an important factor in every Audi site or plant, and battery manufacturing will also be a core component of electric mobility for us. And apart from that, the vertical integration is at a similar level as for combustion engines. Thank you. Then we proceed to another question from Hungary. What is going to happen to the R8? I'm looking to my right, to the person standing to my right. Now, the R8 is the sports icon in our product portfolio. It's extremely important for our image, for the sporty positioning of the brand. And it's still. Um, has a great appeal and vaccination, similar to the TT. As I said before, we are discussing different concepts for potential successor to the R8. At the moment, no definite decision has been taken yet. But to us, it's clear that in future, we have to rethink the concept of a sports car. And we are really focusing on it now. And that we really, I mean, look at the RS Etron GT. This is an impressive example of how we are rethinking it. You can see it here on the stage. Thank you. Then we go to the UK once again. Mr. Piers Ward is asking, what is going to be the impact on Audi if um, Bentley is now managed by Audi, if now Audi assumes management responsibility for Bentley. Marcus, we're very happy that we now are managing Bentley. It's a very strong brand with a great DNA or identity, and we are happy to assume responsibility. And between Bentley and Audi, we will be looking for strong synergies. We see them in the electrification strategy, obviously. Bentley is clearly on its way to becoming a fully electrified brand, and we will do our utmost to make sure that this is also achieved successfully. With this, back to sales, Christoph Seilein from Kfz Betrieb, Next Mobility. He's asking, Volkswagen passenger cars announced yesterday that in summer, the complete online sales of ID models will start all the way up to financing. At Audi, so far, we've only seen an online pilot project with stock vehicles from dealers. When are you going to enter the next stage here? And what is it going to look like? Hildegard. Well, thank you very much for this. Let me anticipate that e-commerce is not that new for Audi. We have an e-commerce platform for used cars, which we installed in 2017. This is when it went live. And we also have online reservation tools for new and used cars, which we introduced in late May of last year. And naturally, uh, I mean, Corona accelerated this whole process for the rollout of our platform, coming up with even more offerings. We already have online sales of new cars, stock vehicles. We piloted it, and this is something that we will quickly roll out now. And naturally, uh, the platform is very important. The platform helps us to scale quickly and at low cost. And the central e-commerce platform, including new cars and used cars, all also including maintenance aspects and leasing financing. This will also be launched, and uh, we are then well prepared. We will catch up with demand very quickly. But let me tell you, our dealers are still our backbone in sales, and the digitalization, this will be um, done together with our dealers. We take our dealers on board, and it's a good cooperation based upon trust. Thank you, Hildegard. Okay, next question is from Germany as well. Markus Fasse, good morning. His question is this, the joint venture with FAW, will they only be the, be the only ones building e-cars or does SAIC also build electric cars, our other partner in China? What about the distribution in the new joint venture with FAW? Markus, could I ask you again? Yes, of course. We have a clear electrification strategy for China, and the portfolio will be f successful, made successful for the future using both partners. The details will be announced at a later stage, and at the Shanghai Motor Show, you will also see some details on that. Audi FAW NEV, the new venture in Changchung will build cars from 2024 based on the new PPE platform. That's the next big milestone for us. Thank you. 
with that, that's, let's come to Spain. Ms. Garcia from La Tribuna de Automotion. She's asking about the future of the Audi A1. In the next generation, will there be a fully electric version of it? And will the car continue to be manufactured in Mattarell? I think there are many good reasons, especially from sales. Hildegard? Yes, indeed. The A1 speaks for itself and offers us a great way for the entry level and the young segment. It's extremely popular and, of course, as the board member responsible for sales, I'm very happy about that. It helps rejuvenate our client base as well and we also have conquest potential with it. So it makes us happy. But the car is just under two years old. So after two years, it's a little too early to talk about the next one. We are looking at that under our portfolio plannings and also with respect to transformation. But as of today, all I can say is it's a very attractive and cool car. Thank you. Yes, indeed, when it comes to the future of our products, we can't give away all the secrets, right? There is a question that has been asked in similar versions before here. Mr. Gleichmauf comes back to it. Mr. Dusman, when listing the models in which ICE engines will continue to be used, the A8 was not included. Does this mean confirmation that there will be no model generation of, for this, for the A8? No, not as such. The A8 is an important model for us. In autumn, it will undergo a model upgrade for the current generation. Today, we have an MHF and PHF model range, which is very strong for the A8, which means the drive systems of the future. Of course, the luxury segment is very important for us. The first Artemis model will also be electric in the luxury car. And when it comes to the A8 successor, we will inform you in due time. Thank you. Let's turn to another question by Mr. Zwick, Die Welt, and Die Welt am Sonntag. Which role will be played by fuel cells and e-fuels in the future strategy of Audi? It's a technical question, so board, the, our board member responsible for technology will answer it. When it comes to fuel cells, well, let me start with biofuels. Synthetic fuels, biofuels are limited when it comes to supply. There is not enough supply of biofuels. When it comes to e-fuels, we are gathering important information when it comes to the production and the way of handling these fuels with our power to gas production in Velta. But for strategic reasons, we don't seek our own fuel production. We support uh, the stakeholders in the market as best we can, but for us it's clear that e-mobility is the leading technology to achieve CO2 emission levels based on fleets, BEV, plug-in hybrids. That's the Audi way. Thank you. Another question by Ms. Garcia from Spain. Will the second generation of the Audi Q2 in 24 and 25 be built in Mozzarella, Spain? Mr. Kessler. Well, of course, when it comes to the utilization of the plants in the corporate group, that is planned in the group. And that's also where the decision will be taken in terms of future manufacturing in Mozzarella and potentially where the Q2 successor will be manufactured. And we'll let you know when we have the decision. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. Let's move on to Japan. Mr. Fukao from Nikkei he is asking, some OEMs have stopped production in North America because of a lack, a shortage of petrochemical parts. Does Audi have similar plans to stop production in Mexico or other plants in the world? A question about procurement. 
is the gross Aloheide. Well, we are taking a very close look at the consequences of the cold weather in Texas and in North America, both with respect to plastic materials but other input materials as well. So we are closely monitoring the market. And so far, I can say that we don't see any impact on production in Mexico. And within our task force and bottleneck management, we are responding to these situations and take mitigating action. My expectation is that production in Mexico will not have to be stopped. Thank you. That brings me to the question by Mr. Lemmings. I guess it's also a follow-up question, the standard in Belgium. How important is it to keep the majority of development in-house? The Volkswagen Group develops software by itself. The same is true for batteries. What about partnerships with suppliers? Are they a thing of the past? It's a group question, so Marcus. Well, when it comes to the key technologies, and that's software and battery, it's very important for us to have a lot of know-how in-house. That doesn't mean that we're going to make everything ourselves. When it comes to make or buy, there's co a collaboration with Microsoft for platforms. And it's very important to us, including other suppliers as well. And the fact that we're developing batteries doesn't mean that we will develop every battery. We'll develop the key parts of it. So suppliers are an important part of that activity and will certainly maintain and nurture these partnerships. Thank you. Another question that was asked repeatedly, management responsibility for Bentley. Mr. Pretzler, Stuttgarter Zeitung. Why does the management responsibility for Bentley change from Porsche to Audi? Marcus again. Well, we've discussed this a lot, and in our point of view, Bentley is a perfect view with the premium brand that Audi is, a fit in our segment and clearly rounds off or rounds up our segment. But let me also be very clear about saying that Porsche did a great job, helped Bentley grow. So my gratitude to Porsche for an excellent job, and will continue that in the same spirit. Thank you. Another question about Mr. Hegler from Süddeutsche Zeitung. Three billion euros are earmarked for digitalization. Does that include the cost for car software org? And in that context, what does mean automated driving from the start of the, sorry, from the middle of the decade? Let me ask Mr. Antlitz to answer the first question. Thank you. The three billion that we mentioned are investments into the future for digitalization by the year 2025 for the Audi brand and uh, everything that is related to that. When it comes to the car software org and the integration for the group architecture, those expenditures or that money is not included. That's in the car software org books. Financially, these two are separate and one on top of the other. Thank you. In that context, what does automated driving mean from the mid of the decade? Oliver Hoffman, perhaps, to be a little more specific on that? No problem. With that streamlining under the CSO organization, with the software competence assembled there, Audi and the group will gather some more speed in this important part of the future. That was the purpose. And as Audi, we benefit a lot from group synergies. Even today, we are using these synergies when developing automated driving. Project Artemis will certainly showcase that, how important that streamlining is, that streamlining of resources in the group. That brings me to a question by Mr. Morsifa from Tagesspiegel. A question about PHEVs. The European Union and the German government are investigating a scenario of abolishing or reducing the subsidies. How would that impact the PF strategy of Audi? 
Marcus, a question for you, I guess. For us, the BEV is the future, and that's why we're heavily investing in BEVs. PHEVs are a bridge technology for Europe in particular. Still, the long haul, long distance at zero emissions locally is an important goal. 58,000 PHEVs uh, as the number I would like to mention there. So that's why we're putting together an attractive portfolio and we'll observe how this develops and subsidies develop. But BEVs are the future for us. Thank you. Then another question from Ms. Vasquez. What is the plan? The lineup produced in Mexico, are you going to extend it beyond the Q5? If yes, if so, is the new model going to be a hybrid or an all electric vehicle? So once again, this relates to production. Mr. Kössler. Now, as I already said before, the Q we have the Q5 in Mexico, and in the market launch, we now also get the Q5 Sportback. Both of these vehicles are highly modern PHEVs, and we are not thinking about further cars for Mexico at the moment because the site is very well utilized with those two vehicles. Thank you. Then a question by William Boston from Wall Street Journal. Hello, Bill. Now, the International Energy Agency yesterday predicted that the demand for petrol engines will never reach the level of 2019 again. Do you agree? What is the future for combustion engines at Audi? Will they become collector items, boutique items, or curiosities for future generations? What does Audi think here? Markus. Well, as I said, combustion engines play a major role for us today, and the further development of the combustion engine will be also driven forward so that it becomes more efficient, meets customer requirements better. Also, as far as emissions are concerned, it will still play an important role. And while we still offer combustion engines, we still want to be best in class for combustion engines. And naturally, we will satisfy worldwide demand. When the last combustion engine will roll off the assembly line, that's a decision that our customers will make. Thank you. Then a question by Mr. Hetzner from Automotive News Europe. What can we expect from Apollon? Where, what can it do? Where is it going to be built and when will it come? Our board member for development should answer, or so I know that he can really give away too much. Nevertheless, with Artemis, Trinity and Apollon, we have three approaches to accelerate the development of new vehicles so that the next major technology leap can be achieved, as Markus Dusman said before, with a different focus in each case. We see a radical shift towards software, digitalization, connectivity with a clear focus on strong battery concepts, powerful batteries. Now with Apollon, which is a project where Audi and Volkswagen, Volkswagen passenger cars, where they collaborate. This will be a system model for the Volkswagen Trinity that we are going to launch. And as Dirk already suggested, in one of the next events of this kind, we might be allowed to tell you a bit more about it. Thank you. Then another question from Mr. Margenheim Hermann from Stuttgarter Zeitung. How many electric models, all electric and plug-in hybrids, did Audi sell in 2020? Hildegard, that's a question for you. Yes, of course, I'm very happy to answer this, and I'm very happy about the sales performance of my entire team, because the share of our electrified Audis has been exactly dub doubled last year. In spite of Corona, 110,000 electric vehicles were sold altogether, and 52,000 approximately are all electric BEVs, and 58,000 of these are P has. So I think that's a really good mix, and it shows that Audi has made a lot of progress on its way to transformation towards all electric vehicles with the highest share that we can show here in the market. So 110,000 cars is the answer. Thank you. Then we have another question from Hungary, uh, Mr. Colossa. Until when will Audi produce uh, the TT sports car in Gyr? 
the production volume is declining all the time, dot, dot, dot. Well, this is not a production-related question. It's related to sales, so Hildegard. But one has to clearly say that the Audi TT is our sporty design icon. And naturally, it's always been an important model that supports our image. And it will stay so for the next few years. And we have so many plans with the product upgrade with a new equipment line competition. Plus, we have a special model, the bronze selection with Audi Sport GmbH. So with all of this, we'll make sure that for quite a while it will remain really attractive. And I hope you understand that at this point in time, I cannot give an exact date. I cannot tell you when we are going to do what with the Audi TT in its life cycle. But for the time being, I can tell you it's still a very attractive icon of the Audi brand. And I'm very grateful for it. Thank you. Then a question by Mr. Kühler from the SWR. Hello, Mr. Kühler. Well, the plan for the Neckarsohn plant is that, first of all, mainly combustion engines with hybrid versions are to be produced, which is what we're already doing today. When will we get an all-electric model for the plant in Neckarsohn? Mr. Kössler. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, actually, I answered this question twice already. Neckarsohn is our focal site for PHEV products today, and it's extremely important in this role. And uh, this will also ensure really good plant utilization at Neckarsulm. In parallel, the Berlinger Hufe are part of Neckarsulm, and they are already fully BEV electrified. And naturally, we have further plans with uh, for the further progress of the BEV model initiative. Of course, we have plans for Neckarsulm as well, and in due time, we will announce them. Thank you. Then a question from an anonymous person, which we will nevertheless answer. Mr. Dusman said that the Q4 e-tron is the Audi model, which gives you the entry or is an entry-level model to the full lineup of the brand. The Q2 e-tron, when will it be seen in Europe? Uh, and just to add, the Q2 e-tron is built in China and also offered in China. So much about the portfolio. Uh, the portfolio question, that's Hildegard. Of course, across the portfolio, we are analyzing how we can gradually introduce the BEVs. And I think we're in a good position with the SUV segment where we show the greatest impact. We started with the e-tron and the e-tron sport bag. These are two powerful models. We talked about them before. The best-selling uh, BEVs of the German premium OEMs. So that was a really good start. And uh, then this was followed by the brand shaper, the RS e-tron GT or e-tron GT. You can see this model here on the stage. This, of course, offers additional appeal for the brand. And now comes the next step with the Q4. Of course, uh, it's a different level of affordability for customers and also scalability for large volumes. That's something that we can generate here. So these are logical steps which we have taken. You mentioned the Q6 before, Marcus. So all of this is now happening step by step in the further rollout of our portfolio. Thank you. Then we come to a question by Mr. Hukau from Nikkei. The Volkswagen Group expects that in the year 2030, 50% of worldwide deliveries will be battery electric vehicles. So what is Audi's objective for the year 2030? Hilligard, another question for you. Well, maybe we first of all look uh, to the period until 2025. We assume that one third of our sales approximately will be electric models by 2025. But in electric mobility, we can see various different drivers. And one driver is naturally the expectations of our societies and uh, above all, customer enthusiasm. And customers are thrilled by the e-tron and e-tron GT. They're really enthusiastic about it. And I think one third by 2025 should be easy to reach. Thank you. Still talking about electric mobility, Mr. Rauwald from Bloomberg News is asking how many of the more than 20 battery electric vehicles planned to be launched by 25 will be based upon MEB and how many will be based upon the PPE. So that's a development question that goes to Oliver Hoffman. Our portfolio of electric models will be consistently rolled out and expanded on these two systems. 
of the MEB, the modular electrification system for compact models, the Q4e tron was mentioned, that will be launched in the market this year. And the PPE vehicles, the premium platform electric for the B to D segment vehicles. So this is a very clear position. Now, this modular strategy means that we can save a lot of resources and costs. And it um, makes it possible for us to quickly roll out innovations that really characterize our brand within the group network. And for 2025, more than 20 all-electric models are planned. And a further expansion of our B have portfolio. Mr. Rawald, you probably noticed that we don't want to give you too detailed an answer because, after all, it's relevant for our competitive position. And speaking of competitors, Mr. Carsten Lemitz from the Standard from Belgium is again asking, some competitors such as Volvo announced that very soon their future will be all electric. Is Audi not ready for this yet? Question that goes to Markus. Now, for I mean, we are ready for the electrified future. This is what we are demonstrating with our new car launches every year, one after the other. New vehicles will be launched, 20 births by 25. I don't think you need to question whether we are really serious about it. And PFs will also be offered, large number of them, and we will also add new ones to our portfolio. That's what we said before. But what is also important to note is that the charging in infrastructure should also grow accordingly so that it can cope with the population of BEF vehicles or anticipate it, in fact. And that's a major focus as well. And this will decide just how quickly the transformation towards e-mobility can proceed and how quickly we can exit from combustion engines. Thank you. Right, we are still talking about e-mobility now, Markus Fasse is asking the plans to install your own Audi quick charging network. How far have these plans progressed? Could you please comment? Now, the competences for charging within the group are at the moment pooled. And as I said before, the further expansion of the charging infrastructure is key. It's vital for e-mobility. And since we invest so much money in e-mobility, it's important to us that um, Customers should always get an attractive offering for charging. But up until now, there have not been any concrete decisions for Audi's own managed or uh, charging infrastructure managed by Audi itself. Then to Spain, Mr. Garcia from El Mundo is asking the prices of the Audi e-tron GT and the GT RS. The RS e-tron GT are very similar to the prices of their cousins, Porsche Taycan and Porsche Taycan Turbo. Don't you think that the Taycan is going to benefit from it? Because the, because customers will say, okay, then I pay 5,000 euros more and then I'll get a Porsche, not an Audi. So that's a question for Hildegard Bodman. Now the e-tron GT is the electric spearhead for Audi. And that means it's at the upper end of our model portfolio. And the e-tron GT, when you drive it, you will say, you will agree with me, it's 100% Audi identity or DNA. Two independent vehicles, the Taycan and Audi e-tron GT, and they are clearly different. They just use the same technical architecture. And that, in fact, helps us as far as costs and synergies are concerned. We can successfully save costs and um, leverage synergies, but simply because they have the same architecture, they are not related, they are not cousins. They are two independent models with the typical properties of the brand that will convince customers that Taycan is a sports car, the e-tron GT is a grand tourer. And we can see this in the feedback from the media and the media coverage. The media agree with us and we get a lot of positive response from the media that we are really happy about. Thank you very much. Well, looks like time is running out, but um, we definitely have time for one more question. Ms. Vermeulen from Automotive Online from the Netherlands. She's asking, in e-mobility, Audi uh, also competes with Tesla. So how is Audi going to hone its profile in the electric market? Artemis and a couple of other models might be important here. Marcus, maybe you can answer. Now, we are very happy that Tesla also accelerated this initiative for electric mobility. And we are also in a good position. As I said, we have various models and some that uh, are clearly superior in the market. Now, Artemis will be a model which, within a record period, by the end of 2024, we want to have it ready for the launch, both in terms of electric drivetrain and also in 
terms of its electrical system, it's going to set new standards. So we are really in a very good position here. Thank you. And with this, I'm going to close the official part of our annual press conference in 2021. After the conference, we will naturally publish a live stream of this conference and also pictures of our digital event. Thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you to the entire organizational team behind the camera, behind the scenes, and uh, everything went almost completely smoothly. And I would like to thank the entire board of management of Audi AG, and I wish you a nice day, and above all, stay healthy. Thank you.